is Jason. Uh, oh, it started now. So, how are you doing, guys? My name is Jason, and I. My name is Woodsider. Woodsider. Great. So, we're talking about Marshall McLuhan, and the medium is the message. So, the medium is the message uh, was basically theorized in the 50s by this guy who was studying print culture and history and telecommunications and media and its effect on people over time. And he came to some pretty startling conclusions. And I guess his most famous quote would be, the medium is the message. Okay, so a medium would be something like <clears throat> can present information to a populace, whether it be television, newspapers, you know, even a phone. So um, a way to break down the medium is the message is it doesn't really matter um, what the content of the message is. It's the medium to have some kind of um, effect on the psyche of people. So for example, telephones were invented in the late 80s, right? And so what Marshall McLuhan would say about the telephone is not concerning its convenient place in modern society. What he would say is um, telephones, it doesn't matter what kind of conversations you're having on the telephone. You know, it. what matters is what the phone has done in order to kind of compress the time and space you know it 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 uh it brought us closer together as as a human race you know, of kind of compressing time and space would you agree yeah I d i'll definitely agree with that uh i mean i think there's multiple ways of looking at that i mean obviously it bridged that gap between long distance communication it cut down that time and yes i mean that itself can have a lot of different um i mean sometimes people don't think about that you know because <laughs> i mean you know some people will be like what are you talking about this is just a it's just a telephone conversation you know how you make it into such a complex thing no i mean just you need to just think like stop and think about it like how it has changed the original way humans used to communicate you know, and what can be the implications of that? That's something I think we need to keep in consideration and keep in mind. Um, yeah, I mean, that's pretty much what I would uh, say on that. Great. So Gutenberg invented the printing press in the 1400s, right? Late 1400s. And so what that did was give people strong your identity, right? Because now people can pick up a book and they can be referred to themselves by reading their own history. And this had this also had a massive impact on culture. But what's interesting about what's going on now politically is that it seems to have contributed to the rise of nationalism, which as you know, nationalism became a thing. Um, in post-industrial society in in Europe in, in the 1800s, and so if the, if it wasn't for print culture, if it wasn't for newspapers, if it wasn't for the printed word, there would be no nationalism. So how do you contain uh, the the rise of these movements um, when everything is being sort of uh, pulled in like a magnet towards both sides of the political spectrum? You know. Right. Well, I mean, again, you know, there's so many ways to look at the effect, you know, let's say, for example, something as simple as the printing press that you described, you know, when it came into being. Um, I'm talking about like people, you know, who have a, a sinister mentality, you know, and how they could use something to their own advantage whether it be personal political in these cases we're talking about is you know how people can use it to their political advantage you know how to 
you know, make the masses sway to a certain set, to a certain mentality, to a certain opinion. These things don't, don't just like, you know, haphazardly happen. These things, uh, I mean, obviously to, to this day, you know, experiment was done. People looked into how, through history, how it has affected it, you know, and people did research. And research in the sense of like a, a sinister research, you know, to um, to see how they can sway opinions to their favor. Um, so yeah, and and, and it, as he, the way it um, tumbled down is today. You know, you have two different. You know, I mean, and and particularly in the U.S., we're talking about you have mainly two political spectrums. You know, and you can constantly see how the media tries to take advantage of that to sway public opinion through whatever means they have. The main means is, <laughs> I mean, it's the medium that they're uh, delivering the content with, you know. So, I mean, the content is going to come to you regardless, but, but it's the medium that is, in a way, affecting it. Uh, I think you need to keep that, or all of us need to keep that in mind. But uh, in this personal bubble of hyperspace where we kind of grab, well, what everything you click uh, when it when it comes to political news or uh, media outlets, it seems as though there's a there's a personal bubble in in on the internet where things are going. You're going to be given things as clickbait, so that, for example, like all the Republicans are listening to their uh, watching Hannity and Combs. You know they're watching. Well, Bill Riley got fired, so he's no longer there, but they're they're you know, they're gravitating towards all these conservative voices in a in an arena where conservative voices have kind of actually been pretty much stifled by Facebook and Twitter. And these things were denied during the congressional hearings. Uh, Facebook and Twitter were up were being grilled by <laughs> by the congressional committee. But the truth of the fact is that conservative voices are being are being silenced and now you have the European Commission saying that we're now going to criminalize anti-migrant speech so this this has a trickle-down effect and it's pretty like you said uh, sinister and kind of nefarious I mean are, are you going to let um, legislation being passed down from a foreign power, or are you going to give the power to the sovereignty of the people? You know, it's that's why the entire they they is a is like a foreign agent basically, and so people are waking up now in Europe, and and the European parliamentary elections are next year, and so this has a, a an interesting effect on the Absolutely. tribalizing. Uh, ways absolutely i mean i just want to say that i mean it's kind of interesting how like in europe you know the, the there there also there's a big struggle between um you know i think um their their struggle with immigration is much more severe than how it's being portrayed here in the u.s you know in the u.s yeah, even at the Mexican border, that immigration crisis is not as bad as um, the crisis in Europe, because Europe, the access point, I mean, like physically, the, 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 the way it's located, I mean, many other continents are pretty much tied uh, to Europe, I mean, by land. So they have a much bigger immigration crisis um, that's why you see there's a lot of um, uh, immigration, um, you know, commotion. But here you have um, uh, the the European uh, Union trying to make these policies, like to to make it illegal to to say anything. I mean, it's I can understand your if you want to protect the immigrants from like physical harm or something like that, but to make a policy where it's like a crime to just talk about these issues. I mean, it's a serious issue. Um, 
and I mean, it's 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 kind of odd, you know. I mean, and that's what empowers a lot of the um, white. I mean, you know, the white nationalist movements or nationalist movements rather. Um, they see these things and they say, you know what, like we want to protect, you know, our our borders because of these things, and it justifies their their uh, you know their belief in that because of when you know. Like for example, you mentioned earlier, the European Union makes policies like that. It it strengthens their their. Their what? I couldn't hear you. I said this, it strengthens their cause. Right, right, absolutely, and also to the effect that Donald Trump has had on, on the world politics and uh, his use of Twitter. Um, his use of Twitter is interesting because he will write something about an issue and then the mainstream media will say the opposite thing, you know? So it creates, um, it creates a, what I, what Baudrillard, which was this uh, French philosopher in the eighties who took on the ideas of McLuhan and added to it. And he created, he theorized uh, something called hyperreality. So hyper reality is is basically like, like an in consciousness to distinguish like reality from a like simulation of reality, you know, and it's all two opposing viewpoints, and you don't know how to distinguish one from the other, then that's where confusion rests, and then we don't know how to deal with certain um, uh, issues that are very important to deal with, you know, because if it's not and th and these are difficult things to deal with because if, if they're not important then they wouldn't be difficult you know so i'm afraid that um that mass consumerism contributes to hyper reality you know because we constantly have to differentiate one product from the other this one is this kind of product this one is that so buy that one so i think all these signs and symbols uh, we kind of now, because of social media and the social media, we kind of prefer the sign to the to the real thing, you know. And I think selfie culture is an example of that, you know, because we're always we're showing the world how we want to be seen, not how we really are, you right. know. So I think that's really interesting. I think uh, it also promotes. Um individualism uh, i mean individualism it, in itself um i mean oh yeah you know, Before, a lot of people i'm sorry to cut you off but yeah. when it comes to uh, individualism the printed word also created in kind of individualism or gave rise to individual rights you know because before all our senses were kind of more more physical like right we engage with the world with the way we, we are with the other senses not sight you know sight was a different thing but now that we can read words we can, we can impose linear thought uh right. in rational rational ways you know so right. uh so what Absolutely. were you gonna say about that uh, i was just gonna say that you know it gave rise to individualism and i mean you can see that as a simple example of selfie you know that the individual of attention you know uh, i mean in 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 one way it does empower like individuals to express their opinions but the side effect of that is that everyone is spewing their opinions as right you know there's no way of distinct there's so much people just like spewing their opinions totally you know being considerate of giving extra time to formulate their thoughts they just want to put it all is you know loathing in their mouth uh, to put it that way um and yeah and and that feeds you know this um, um as you earlier also the, the hyper reality you know that we are um experiencing or living in but i think you had mentioned something about uh, tribalism um goes back to something McLuhan also mentioned so yeah, if you want to elaborate on that. Oh yeah, so he basically called uh, the world globalization, which he he wasn't um, 
he died before globalization ever ever made an impact in the world stage. But he referred to um, the globalization and the coming together of, of uh, world politics and, and nations as a global village to characterize the world that we live in today. And today we kind of character, what, what do we call it now? Like this world that we're living under, it's not as, uh, we kind of put rose colored glasses on, on, uh, on what's going on now. But McLuhan was very critical and he didn't let his opinions affect the way he saw. And basically the quote is, together, the closer you get together, the more you like each other. There's no evidence of that in any situation that we've ever heard of. When people get closer together, they get more and more savage and impatient with one another. So the global village is a place of very arduous interfaces and very abrasive situations. So it's the opposite of what most people would think is, yeah, the world is getting closer and closer together, but does that mean we're getting along? Not so much. I think uh, you caught off at the last moment. Couldn't hear your last statement. Oh, yeah, there is no evidence that, that shows that, according to McLuhan, that the more we get together as, as globalized uh, globalization, that we're not getting along, you know, we're actually repelling that notion. And you can see it now. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I will just like to add to that, like, I mean, the way you can see it, and I mean, this is something, you know, that when you and I were talking about, like, we look at the NYC subway, you know, I mean, everyone what? has their personal space, you know, as a train. Everyone has a personal space in the, you know, like when you're riding the subway, in the, the, the you know, like the NYC subway. Yeah. And then when the train gets crowded, you can see people, the way they behave, it starts to change. You know, everyone's now like more, you know, like defensive, more, um, you know, looking out for everything, looking out for their properties and stuff <laughs> like that. Like the, yeah. The feeling of trust goes away. You have like less people riding on the train. There's, you know, you can kind of feel, I guess, a little bit more ease, et cetera, you know. But I mean, I'm just, I mean, that's just what came to my mind that I observe, you know, that uh, like the more people that start to converge in a place, it's it's just it's up for, you know, like a like a, a nasty environment in the sense of people feel insecure, people feel like defensive and anything, I'll look them off. I mean, we, we see that all the time. Uh, again, like I said, on the examples of Subway, you know, all you got to do is just like brush upon someone and, you know, people are just, I guess, had a bad day. They'll just, you know, just flip out and others, you can, you can see they have on their faces, you know, like a disgust feeling like, like don't touch me, you know, in that sense, even though it wasn't just an accident. Or as yeah. you gave the example uh, yesterday about, you know, like when someone is like eating, you know, and then like in a restaurant or something or like, you know, in a place and some someone else comes in and kind of gets close to that person is eating. He's going to start feeling a little. Um, I think um, I think I don't know. I mean, I think we've all felt that in a way, you know, um, yeah, we we just don't embrace each other in that sense. You know, um, so when, when you know when there's a lot of people around us, it, it ends up being the opposite. So, um, yeah. How can how can we compare that to the world stage? You know, the train is the world, and the passengers are all the nations of the of the of the planet. And the, but the train is going somewhere, but it's not going to like everyone has to go somewhere on the train. Eventually, everyone has to get off. Somebody has a destination, but the train itself is. It continues on and on and on and on, and it's it never stops, right? Right. So to speak, and in a way, social media is kind of the same kind of container, right? Because it doesn't really the train doesn't have a a, a journey. It has a journey for everyone, right? Just like social media, everyone is on social media. Oh snap! Is that a squirrel? Yeah. Everyone's on social media, but what's the purpose of Twitter? Like, where? What is the what is the eschatology of Facebook? Like, where? What is the purpose of it? It's 
You know what I mean? Uh, these things are not very easily ident identifiable. I mean, I, I think on that, save those discussions for maybe the next session if we're going to have one. Okay, but well, before we go, I wanted your opinion on one one last quote that I wanted to uh, share with you and everyone. So the quote is, there was an article that it's called Beyond Easy, and it's called, well, Beyond Easy is the name of the website, and you can go read it. Um, the name of the article is from two, uh, is McLuhan, The New Tribalism and the Equivalence of Thought and Action, and it's from 2015. So the quote from this writer, he said, I can't find his name, by the way, so I can't give him credit, but it's there for you. It said, to the Gutenberg mind, actions can be sanctioned, but thoughts cannot. Saying something is not the same as doing something. But in the emergent tribalism that we're seeing now, uh, this is no longer the case. So that's why people are being criminalized not for doing something, but for thinking something and having certain opinions. Do you know what I mean? It all ties together, bro. It's crazy. What are your final thoughts on that? Oh, I mean, I guess I would, I would uh, attribute that to you. Um, the, the, the like why the is it that electric mind yeah why is it that after good after the printing press we we kind of detribalized and then with the rise of electronic media in the 20th century we became retribalized but why is it that electronic media sharing informations like why is it that why do people take it to so personal when it comes to hold, harboring our own beliefs and our own ideologies and politics well i mean i guess essentially it's the difference between the way printing press you know uh, process things and the way electronic media processes things which is probably like fifty thousand times faster you know right. it's it's more of an instantaneous uh uh access to information um i think you know and also the way human mind progresses you know as time goes by we do we i guess develop ways to kind of um take all that information and you know even as it's coming as fast as it's coming you know and we're also processing it as we can you know, and, and, and I mean, I guess it gets faster and faster. And because of that, that also, um, um, I guess the, the end result is that, um, I mean, basically it, it, it speeds up the process. You know, I guess that's what I'm trying to say. So, and then that's why I like the magnitude of the effect is much more now. So on this uh, second, Tribal, retribalism. Yeah, um, and so, and yeah. in a way, uh, hum, human human beings kind of they contribute to it as much as these emergent technologies um, are the main cause of it. You know, science and technology come together, and they are changing the way human beings are. But you know, you it would be very uh, it's very difficult to accept uh, for most people that we're being retribalized by electronic and digital media but this is this is very much a fact and we're seeing it on a daily basis right, so right. i mean yeah we see it more and more yeah more and more uh, especially since the rise of social media and that's why what inspired me to make this video is because it's all kind of connected in this nebulous haze that begs to be broken down in a much more deeper understanding and so thank you for for being here, man. I really appreciated talking about these uh, yeah, complex yeah. socio-political issues. No problem, man. Anytime. <laughs> All right, man. All right. Hope you guys got something out of that. If you you know something informed. So, see you in the next one. Peace. Peace.
one. <laughs>